we still studying the end of the age. We cannot stop studying this because each time we're going deeper and deeper, we're learning more. We're learning about the last days. And in the past few sessions, we were talking about, uh, we were talking about what, how to please God. Okay. People are always looking out how to please God. How do I please God? What do I do to please God? And then you remember that scripture we read uh, uh, about this young ruler, this rich ruler. You know, he did everything right. And then he says, now what does he do? Then Jesus said, well, go sell everything you have now. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. I mean, that disheartened him, disheartened him because he was, he, was so, uh, he was so wealthy. You understand? So what pleases God? How do we please him? And especially in these last days, because every good thing we do now is actually an accumulation of what's going to take place in glory. What's going to take place for us in eternity or what's going to take place for us in heaven? when the heavenly dimension comes down here to the earth, when we all rule and reign together with Jesus Christ here on the earth, what's going to happen at that time will be determined by what we're doing now. Please, this is not a matter of being a good person or not being a good person. This is a matter of how to please God our Father. So I've got a few questions and I'm going to answer them, okay? As I ask the questions, I'm going to answer them and then we're going to go into scripture, right? So the first question is, how do we honor the Lord in these last days? You must understand it's crucial. It's crucial. Uh, you know, when people are going on a journey, and when they're about to arrive at their des destination, these preparations, uh, they, they, they prepare to disembark the plane or the vehicle they've been driving or whatever. You know, it's like we've been on this journey now for almost 6,000 years here on the earth. And as you know, if you understand scripture uh, properly, uh, when Jesus spoke about, uh, in the parable, he spoke about uh, uh, the, the earth being given on lease. God gave the earth to Adam on a 6,000 year lease. So Adam and Eve fell from the glory of God and handed that lease over to the devil. So now, before that, Adam was the God of this world. Adam, God made him God of this world. So what he did was took his status when he, when he sinned, when he became disobedient to God, that was the sin, and he handed his status to the devil. So the devil was not the God of this world. He was not the God of this earth. Adam handed it over to him. Are you, are you, do you understand what I'm saying? So the earth is coming to the close of his lease to the close of the sixth day. <coughs> and the seventh day will be the millennium that everyone's looking for. So the question is, we're living in such a crucial time right now. It's like everybody is getting ready to get off the bus because we're coming to the end of the journey. The question is, how do we honor the Lord in these last days? Can we continue with the way we have been continuing our whole lives for the past decades? All right, the, the, the answer to that question is, we honor God, our Father. We honor Him by ministering to Him. The word ministering is a, sounds like a big word, but it's not. It means serving God, ministering to Him. It means attending to the needs that God has. God has needs? Yes, I'll show it to you in Scripture just now that God has needs. And you and I are called to minister to God, to do, minister for God, minister to God. The next question, what's the definition of ministering to the Lord? What's the definition? What definition would you like? Let me give you my definition. It means outfelt worship. It's when we, like what we, we did this morning, you know, we just worship. We get emotional. You know, to be honest with you, there's some songs that I sing in the office, I can't sing with a dry eye. Because they're so touchy, they're so personal. You know, I cannot have like any other experience but the experience, emotional experience. 
I, uh, that happens all the time. So I'm experienced in what I'm saying. So how do I define ministering to the Lord? Firstly, it's heartfelt worship. Please, don't copy other people when it comes to worship. God don't want you to behave like anyone else. He wants you to behave like you because you are unique. Am I right? You're not like everyone else. You're different. Everyone's different. So you, when you start copying what other people do as ministry unto the Lord, it's not genuine. It's not you. People worship God differently. All right? Some people just worship. The Westerners got a different way of worshiping. And the Eastern has got a different way of worshipping. But because we are Eastern people, I take to the Eastern way of worshipping. Understand? That is why I decided, uh, you know, last year, Lord, I want to learn uh, my, my Indian languages. I want to learn. I want you to teach me. I want to be able to sing to you with my mother tongue. See, my mother was a Telugu speaking. My father was Tamil speaking. Way down the line, we had a granny, a great granny that was Hindi speaking. So we got a whole lot of that kind of blood in us. You understand? So I learned now I'm singing a Tamil song. I'm singing a Telugu song. I'm singing a Hindi song. I'm singing Malayalam. I couldn't believe it myself. That is because I'm praying and I'm serious about my worship. You understand? I'm not settling for what the West is giving me. What America is doing, what Australia is doing, what this country is doing, what that country is doing, what that odd shot singer is doing. No. God wants my worship, my ministry. So that is why he got me to sit down and write songs. He says, you need to write songs that people must sing to me. I don't want to, them to write songs singing about themselves. Because a lot of it they sing today, it's about themselves. I want them to sing songs to me. I want you to play the guitar for me. I want you to sing to me. So I want you to write that kind of song. So ministry, first and foremost, it's heartfelt worship. It's heartfelt praise. It is heartfelt thanksgiving. You know, when, when we lack praise and thanksgiving, we lack two very, very big uh, things in our lives. Foundational stones, I might call them. Worship, praise, and thanksgiving are major foundational stones in, every, in the life of every Christian. Right? And how do, we, how do we honor God? How do we minister to Him? Okay, through worship, through praise, through thanksgiving, through offerings. People think that offerings are not serious matter. Offerings are serious matter. Because so offerings you can't give to man. Offerings is what you give to God. Tithes? Tithes you do not give to men. You're not giving to a church. You're not giving to an organization. All right? You're giving to God. That's what tithes is. It's his portion. All right? And the next thing is, you minister to God by taking care of people. That pleases him. We covered a lot of ground when it came to that. All right? You must understand this. There is transforming power in ministering to the Lord. There is transforming power. I'm going to show you that in Scripture now. So we're going to read from Acts chapter 12, verse 25. Just one verse here. All right. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Let us skip over to chapter 13, <laughs> verse 1. Now in the church... That was at Antioch. Now the Antioch church was the first multiracial church. Okay, there was people from all over the world there. All right, it was a Gentile church, but there were a lot of Jews there as well. Okay, it was in internationally known. So now in the, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul, who was actually Paul, the Apostle. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord, I want you to focus on that word again. As they ministered to the Lord and fasting. So what were they doing? Ministering to the Lord. They were worshipping him. <clears throat> they were giving God heartfelt worship. 
as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. There is transforming power in ministering to the Lord. Some people, you know, they don't think that they will get the needs met when they do that. Let me remind you of something. That the only way for you to get supernatural intervention in your life is to maintain a life that is constantly ministering to the Lord. So while they were fasting and praying and they were ministering to the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Verse 3, listen, Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on Barnabas and Saul, they sent them away as missionaries. Now, only, see, why I'm saying this is that we, even when it comes to your personal needs or when it comes to the, need, to the needs of other people that you're busy helping, you cannot find the answer in yourself. You'll only find it in the Word of God by the help of the Holy Spirit. You will find it by the help of the Holy Spirit in His Word, but the foundation stone of ministering to the Lord is important. You've got to maintain a life of worship. You've got to maintain a life of praise, a life of thanksgiving. And I'm not talking about casual. I'm not talking about doing it casually. No, every time when I'm driving on the road, I pray. That's casual. I do that all the time. I've been doing it now for I don't know how many years. So, so that's just casual. I mean, it's not really intimate and serious enough. When you're driving on the road or you're traveling somewhere or whatever, you know, you, you, you're ministering unto the Lord. That's good. I will encourage that. But there has to be time set apart where it's just you and the Lord. You listening? So from that position of ministering to the Lord, constant ministry to the Lord, new developments will take place in your life. Supernatural things will happen. We must understand this. So let's, let's jump over now to Matthew 25. Now there's something that Jesus spoke, speaks about here. <coughs> is a challenge to a lot of people, particularly churches and church leaders. You, you would notice that when we're reading this scripture now, that there are more churches that are not practicing this than practicing it. This is what we should be doing as a church. This is what we should be doing as children of God. But you can't find many people doing it. Even though some of them have the resources to do it. Even though some of them are positioned to do it. But they just don't do it. Alright, so service, you know, basically what this, this entire portion of scripture is saying Service to others is ministry to the Lord. Service to others is ministry to the Lord. We will look at, just read the scripture with me from Matthew 25, verse 31. When, now, I want you to follow me very closely here yeah, because there's some things Jesus is revealing here yeah, about heaven, right? I told you, there are times he's, he talks about some very serious things. Like in this, in this uh, section of scripture, like as I was reading it and meditating and studying on it, I said, Lord, you went very deep here. And this in the context of what? Taking care of people. So you can see what is the pride and joy in his heart. What is the thing that moves God in his heart? And, and, and we will think, you know, feeding poor people and clothing the naked people are just like, you know, I mean, if we can, if it's okay. No. Listen to the context. Read with me. So he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Talking about heaven, right? Verse 32. All the nations, not certain nations, all the nations will be gathered before him. Picture this in your mind. And he will separate them one from another, 
as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Let me remind you here. I know we've got some legalistic preachers out there that misquote this here. There is no goats in the, in the church, in case you didn't know. We're all sheep. Say amen. amen. All right? So I know some legalistic holiness preachers think that there are goats and sheep in the church. No, no. There's only sheep in the church. All are sheep. We'll, we'll find out now who's the goats, okay? Verse 33. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Distinctive separation here now. Right? Distinctively, you will know them. The ones on the right hand side are his sheep, and the one on the left hand side is the goats. <coughs> then the king will say to those on his right hand, that's us, right? Come, you're blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the, of the world. Say amen. amen. Say, I'm part of that. I'm part of it. Oh, come on. Say like you really believe it. You can't be hungry already. Say like you believe it. Say, I'm part of this. Part of he says, then the king, that's talking about himself, will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 35. For I was hungry. Listen to the context, church. This, this, I mean, if nothing makes you tremble, this will make you tremble if you get into the, if it gets into the core of your being, it'll make you shake. It'll make you shiver. Listen to the context. He's talking about him being in glory, sitting on his throne in glory. He's talking about all the nations that have come and come before him. He's talking about the separation of the sheep and of the goats. And in the same context, he's for, he's, now who is he talking to? He's talking to the goats. No, 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 sorry. He's talking to the sheep, okay? To the ones on the right-hand side. This is what he's saying. If you think this is not important, I don't know what to tell you. This is what he's saying to the sheep. Let's go back to verse 34. Let's not confuse the context. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, right, the sheep, that's us. Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 35, talking to the sheep again, for I was hungry and you gave me food. If you think this is not important. How was thirsty and you gave me drink? How was a stranger and you took me in? Verse 36. How was naked and you clothed me? How was sick and you visited me? How was in prison and you came to me? Verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty? And give you drink. Verse 38. When did we see you, stray, see you a stranger? And take you in. Or naked and clothe you. Listen to his reply. Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You think that's not important still? Do you think that's not important? We talk about ministering to the Lord in the session. How do I minister to the Lord? I love him, I serve him, I dedicate my life to him, I worship him, I cry out to him, I praise him, I give him thanksgiving. But still insufficient if I'm not ministering to him, but ministering to his brethren. Please look at the importance of this whole thing. Look at the importance of this whole thing. Verse 41. 
Then he will also say to those on the left hand, the goats, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Let me just remind you of one thing here. Yeah. There will be not one child of God who acknowledges Jesus Christ as their shepherd is going to go to hell. Can you say amen? All right, verse 42. For I was hungry. Look at what he's holding against them, right? For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. Verse 43. <coughs> I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. You know what? How hurtful do you think this sounds if that address has to go to a Christian? How hurtful do you think the heart of the Father will be if the King of all glory has to address a Christian in this way? Because not all Christians are doing this. They're not. Some of them do it, they do it just for photographic purposes. They do it for popularity. They do it for fame. But they don't really do it. I'm not saying all, I'm saying this. Some of them don't. But they're on the batch on the right hand side, you see. They're part of the sheepfold. Not goats. But he's addressing the goats. All right, verse 44. Oh, verse 43. Did we read that? Go back to verse 43. I was a stranger and you did not take me in, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Verse 44. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? See the word minister? Verse 45. Then he will answer them saying, As shortly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Verse 46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now sometimes what we do is we think that everything about church is spirituality. No, no, no. There's a huge portion of it that is practical, that is physical, and that is necessary for you and I to do. Do you think when Jesus fed the 5,000 plus people on that mountain that day, was he just performing a miracle or was he feeding hungry people? The time when he fed the 4,000, they were with him for about three days. The disciples said, send them away so they can buy food in the village. He said, no, these people have been with me for three days. If I send them, they'll probably faint on the way. So he said, how much of bread you got and fish? And they said, well, we got seven loaves and a few fish. He says, bring it here. And just like how he fed the 5,000 plus, he fed the 4,000 plus. Do you think he was just performing a miracle to show the people how powerful he is and how great he is? Or was he actually taking care of someone's need? Feeding hungry people. Can you see how deep this runs in his heart? Feeding hungry people. Clothing naked people. Taking people in, helping them, caring for them. Can you see how much part of his nature this is? No, the church, what it often does is it spiritualizes everything and we think those things are not important. But I'm stressing to you, to you here in this session today how important this is and showing it to you even in Scripture. All right? So let, let, let's go now to Luke chapter 7 and we're going to look at some other aspects of how to minister to the Lord. Okay? Luke chapter 7, verse 36. <coughs> Okay, just read with me again. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. One of the Pharisees invited 
Jesus to come to his house to have a meal. All right? And this Pharisee's name was Simon. He had leprosy. But I think the Lord Jesus healed him. All right? Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Verse 30, uh, 37. And behold, I want you to please, as we read this here, let this, let this story register in your mind because it's going to shock you the next scripture we're going to read. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, she was a prostitute, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Now you must understand, there is high level of equality here. When you look at the woman now personally ministering to Jesus, and then you look at the group of people that are ministering to his brethren, as he called them, how personal this is. One is not more important than the other. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay? So what she did was, she, and behold a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Very, very, very expensive. All right? Verse 38. <coughs> and stood at his feet behind him. You know how they sat at the table in those days? They never sat upright like how we sit today. The table was in front of them and it was just slightly above the ground, uh, the floor, and they leaned on cushions. And if you're sitting here at the table, your legs will be out there at, behind you. Okay, can, can you pick, picture that? And stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears. And wiped them with her hair, with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with a fragrant oil. Oh. You know, this past week, uh, Haley expressed her love to me in a very funny way. You know, I was sitting there and carrying Anna, and they were busy laughing and all that. She came and held my hands, and she started kissing my palm inside and outside, all over. She's, and I was just looking and watching this child. And I pictured this here. I said, Lord, what, what level of love has this child got uh, for me? To actually do this, just kissing one way. Then I caught both her hands and I started kissing both her palms as well. Now, why, why I share that with you to, to go back to this woman now? She was not just being emotional for the sake of being emotional. I mean, this woman was serious about what she was doing. Firstly, she stood behind him and she wept and tears were falling on the feet of Jesus. She washed his, washed his feet with her tears. She dried it with her hair. And she, she kissed his feet and anointed them with that fragrant oil. That was very, very expensive. You must understand this woman was a prostitute. In those days, prostitutes are very well, were very wealthy. They owned the best of everything. The, you, the, the, the best of the fragrant you know, uh, perfumes and whatever. And jewelry. I mean, they were known for jewelry. They wore their hair in a very particular way that when, when someone sees them, they'll know who they are. They, they, they used to wrap their hair around their head and make it like a little, I don't know what you call it, but a little like a mountain. <clears throat> and each layer of hair that went around the head was pinned with a gold hairpin. So she had a lot of gold on her head. As the hair was wrapped around the head, going up into that fancy, you know, style. But the scripture says here that she was now, she was wiping his feet with her hair. Do you think that was simple? I don't think. I think this was quite dramatic. Because then she started taking out the jewelry, you see, to open her hair out. As she knelt before him. And each piece of jewelry probably represented something in her life. And she laid that jewelry at his feet. That happened. You know, at his feet. As she opened up her hair. For it to be long enough 
so that she could wipe his feet with her hair. This woman was serious about this. And then she broke that alabaster jar of fragrant oil and she poured it on his feet. Now this is, this is ministering directly to Jesus Christ. That is why I worked like that last night when he asked me, told me, you didn't play the guitar for me the whole week. He says, are you going to play the guitar for me now? I said, yes, Lord, I will do that just now. So sometimes we, we don't know we, how important this is. We don't know how important this is to actually minister to him. And here one, she's a prostitute. In that whole place, in that wherever they lived. We find out who she is just now. Verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him, Simon, saw this, he spoke to him to himself. He's not saying anyone else, he's speaking to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner, she's a prostitute. Verse 40. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. Verse 41. There was a certain creditor. Jesus is now giving him a parable, right? Trying to teach him something. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. <coughs> two people that owed him money. One owed 500 denarii and the other owed 50. Next verse, 42. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. All right? He freely forgave them both. So tell me, therefore, which of them will have love him more? Okay, so he had two people that owed him money. One owed him 500, the other one owed him 50. So when they couldn't pay the debt, this man forgave them the debt. And he cancelled the debt. The question from Jesus to Simon was, who, between these two people, who do you think loved that man more? Let's hear what Simon is saying. Verse 43. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. So in other words, the person who had a bigger debt will love more. Because they've been forgiven for something huge. Verse 44. Then he turned to the woman and said, and said to Simon. Jesus turned to the woman, still talking to Simon. Do you see this woman, Simon? I entered, listen to this carefully. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. Verse 45. You gave me no kiss. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. Ministering directly to the Lord. Verse 46. You did not anoint my head with oil. But this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil, with the most expensive. Apparently it was made out of spike nard. All right, verse 47. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Verse 48. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now I've been on both sides in ministry. I've, I've, I've experienced both, two kinds, both kinds of people, I might say. The one who loved much and the one who loves very little. I must say this to you, not as a judge, but out of good observance. Most Christians love very little. 
They love very little. But I'll tell you the ones who actually love much. The ones who know what the Lord has actually forgiven them for. This one man got saved in my ministry. He was a drug addict. He was a alcoholic. He was abusive. I mean, everything wrong in the world, this guy did. And he got saved by observing my life and gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And then I started to nurture him. You know, at that time, I was, as, as, as you know, I had a church at the place where I worked. So I was the pastor there of that church and I took care of this man every single day. But I watched him so closely. You know, he, was, he, he got saved about two weeks before he needs to appear in a court for five different charges. All the cases are coming up on the same day. If they found him guilty on one case, he's going to go to prison for a long time. And these were not small cases, mind you. These were huge cases. So he came and uh, gave his heart to the Lord and whatever. Then we prayed with him and all kinds of things. And there's a pastor. He lived in Chatswood, so he was going to a church. And that pastor was also taking care of him. And then he came to me one day during that week. And he told me, you know, I have, I'm going appearing in court next week. You know my life. You know the way I lived. I mean, he was a gangster, he was a musician, he, everything that was, you could do in the world, he did. All right? He was non, non, non-Christian. He was a Hindu. Then he told me next week was a certain date I'm appearing in court. I don't know what's going to be the result of it. Uh, if they find me guilty on any one of those charges, I'll go to jail. So I told him, you know, you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. I said to him, that's the biggest step you've ever taken. And he says to me, you don't have to tell me that, Pastor. I know. I know what Jesus has forgiven me for. You don't know half the things I did. You don't know how much of wrong things I did. I did everything in the book, everything in the world I did. Only I know what Jesus Christ actually forgave me for. So what happened was, I told him, okay, let's pray. You're going for this case next week. I'm going to pray that those cases get cancelled. I mean, get withdrawn. He said to me, it's not going to be easy because there's five different people with five cases. One case each against me and all are going to appear in court with their lawyers and whatever. I said, okay, you know Jesus. How clean you're feeling right now? He says to me, I'm feeling clean. Every weight has been taken off me. I mean, I, I've, I, you can see this man is bubbling with joy he never had in his life. So I said to him, I'm going to believe God with you <laughs> that these cases are going to get thrown out of court. They're going, to, they're going to be withdrawn. So we prayed. So the week following that, he went to court on that day. So when he was in court that morning, I prayed. I said, Lord, help your child, Jesus. You forgave him for all his sins. And now they're going to judge him for the wrong things he did. I know you've forgiven him for that as well. Make it possible that those, all those cases get withdrawn. You wouldn't believe what happened. He came to work the next day, smiling from year to year, overjoyed, overjoyed looking for me. And then he found me in that little church I had there. He says to me, wow, have I got a testimony to give you. I asked him, what happened? He says, just like as you said, every case was withdrawn. Do you know what the man did the following week? He had a, such a beautiful car. He took the car, he went and sold the car, he took all the money, he put it in a bank account of a missionary that was working in Cape Town who was raising up money to buy a tent. The question is, could I get any one of the Christians, old Christians there to do that? No. Now what about me? If I give this away, what I'm going to do? That's why I'm telling you. There are not many Christians that know how to even love and minister to Jesus. Because it's all about them. It's all about just receiving. 
And that's not the only thing that Kai did. I mean, he did so many things. I just had to share that with you as an illustration for you to know what the Lord shared here about one who loves much is the one who knows who they are and where they're coming from. And let's jump over quickly to Luke chapter 10. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 10. And this is a story very common. Now it happened as they went that Jesus entered a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Okay, just picture this in your mind also. Verse 39, use your imagination. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. <clears throat> Verse 40. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to, to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Do you think that argument was fair? I think it was fair. Do you know what it is to feed 13 grown, hungry men? I mean, this is not like just take, you know, cutting a can of fish here or buying one pizza. These are hungry men, 13 of them. I mean, you have to slaughter some. I think even one chicken wouldn't be enough. These are 30, 13 hungry missionaries. 12 disciples and Jesus Christ enter into your house to eat. I mean, they've come a long way. You can't give them peanut butter sandwich, you understand? Preparing the food is going to take many hours. What are you going to slaughter? I don't know. Maybe a lamb? Or whatever. And you're going to prepare this whole thing? And Martha was doing it all on her own. And I think this argument was fair. That she said to Lord, don't you care? I mean, look at her sitting here by you. And I'm preparing this stuff, and I mean, a lot. Martha was a woman of the golden heart, in case you didn't know. She was, I mean, everything about Martha was all positive. There was nothing negative about this woman. And it's not as if she never had faith and she wasn't listening to the words of Jesus Christ while she was busy. I can prove it to you through scripture. That woman, Martha had a lot in her. Remember when her brother died, Lazarus? Who was the first one that ran out to Jesus? It was not Mary, it was Martha. What did she say to him? Lord, if you had been here, he would not have died. Who said that? Martha. So Martha wasn't ignorant and foolish. She was all ears when Jesus was ministering, but she was all hands and feet as well. Martha was a person with a golden heart. But I want you to see something here. Verse 41. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. It's regarding the food, right? But verse 42. <clears throat> but one thing is needed. For who? For Mary. But one thing is needed for Mary. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. So who is this Mary? This Mary was the same prostitute that came to him in Simon's house, that repented and wept before him and washed his feet with her tears and dried it with her hair and broke that alabaster box and anointed his feet. This is the same Mary. This woman was so hungry for Jesus, so hungry for the word of God, 
that even food didn't matter for her that much. And she just sat there. And the Lord said, well, she chose the best part, the good part. She had to. But you know, this life of this woman didn't stop here. Didn't stop here. Because uh, one of the other gospels says that when she anointed him with that oil, she was actually preparing his body for burial. So she was a sinner, but she was operating already in the prophetic. You know, there were three women that went to the tomb that morning that he rose from the grave. One of them was this Mary. So this Mary, wherever those 12 men followed Jesus, the 12 disciples, they were not 12. They were always 13. But the Bible shouldn't mention that. They were always 13. Because Mary was always with them, going with them, ministering with them, helping them, serving them. When they fed the poor, she was there too. So we're talking about ministering to the Lord. And we can see this woman. Please forgive me, there's one more that we've got to read from Luke chapter 4. Just two verses from there. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. This is not that Simon. Now this is Simon Peter, his, his disciple. Okay, But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. They told him, you know, she's unwell. She's got a high fever. So, next verse. So he stood over her, Jesus stood over her, and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Guess what happened? And immediately she arose and served them. You see, ministering to the Lord, that's what she did. Peter's, Peter's mother-in-law. Now again, preparing food for 13 hungry men. There was now maybe 14. Mary could be with them as well. Because she always hung out with him. She, every day she was with Jesus. Wherever they traveled, she went. Now she was probably also there. Maybe she didn't come into the house, but she would probably sit outside. Because that's how much she loved the Lord, and that is how much, how devoted she was. And then coming back to Peter's mother-in-law, I don't know what this old lady went and slaughtered. I mean, you can't, as I'm saying, you can't make a light meal for them. I mean, if you're giving them food, you've got to give them real food, hardcore food. You understand? You can't make them a little sandwich or, you know, something small. So here you are, ministering to the Lord again. So the two things I, will believe, I believe personally that is, that is equal to each other. Ministering directly to Jesus, like Mary did, like Peter's mother-in-law did, like Martha did, ministering directly to him. There are some things that you do in this life which is, which is directly related to him here on the earth. And there's some things that you do in this life. He is also related to him, but it comes through other people. In other words, two things. Ministering directly to him as your Lord and your King, in whichever way you know best, and then ministering to people, helping people. When you put the two things together, you, you can see how equal they are. One is not greater than the other. Both are equally. That is the reason why when they ask the Lord Jesus Christ, what is the greatest commandment in the Bible? This is what he told them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your might. He didn't stop there. He says the second commandment is just like the first one. Just like the first one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus called it one commandment. So let's put our efforts in. 